In this video, I am going to illustrate using a deep convolutional neural network to discover parameters that underlie two-dimensional Gaussian blurs. And I'm going to start this video with a discussion about data and the difference between the goals of deep learning and the goals of statistics. And then I will tell you about the project that we will implement, which will involve using a deep CNN to discover hidden parameters in these kinds of data. Then we will switch to Python and I will show you how to implement these data and this model in PyTorch. Now you do not need a background in deep learning or Python coding in order to follow along with the video, but there will be some details that you won't fully understand. If you are interested in learning more about deep learning, then I have a full course on the topic and you can find information about that in the description of this video. Let me start with a discussion of data and ways of treating data. So data are collections of numbers that we extract from the world through sensors or satellites or questionnaires that people fill in or image pixels from a camera. Now there are some fundamental laws of the universe. These are physical or biological or psychological processes that cause the data to be the way that they are. For example, if our data is a picture of a cat, then those data are not the cat. The data are just numerical values that are organized into a matrix. But there is something about cats, there is some set of physical and biological attributes of cats that cause the image pixel values to have a certain distribution, a certain correlation structure, and so on. Now, generally speaking, there are two things that we can do with data. One is to determine diagnostic features in order to make some prediction about an outcome or a label. For example, maybe we want to use data to predict whether a patient has a tumor or not, or whether an image is of a cat or of an elephant. So in these cases, we don't actually care about the underlying generative parameters as long as we have accurate predictions. And this is often the goal of deep learning and other areas of machine learning. On the other hand, we can also use these data to try to estimate the underlying generative parameters. And this is often the case in basic science or fundamental research. So here we are using the data to try to understand something about how nature works, not to make a category assignment. And this is generally the goal of statistics. Now, to be fair, this is a bit of an artificial distinction saying that deep learning is focused on determining diagnostic features, and statistics is focused on estimating parameters. So that is a little bit of an artificial distinction. You can, of course, use statistics to do categorization, and you can use deep learning to estimate generative parameters. In fact, this is exactly what we are going to do in this video. We are going to develop a deep learning model that can estimate the generative parameters that underlie data. And we are going to do that in a fairly simple model of two-dimensional Gaussian blurs. So what we are going to do is simulate data. We're gonna make up our own image data according to these formulas, which I'll explain in a moment, and then use a deep learning model to estimate the original model parameters, the generative parameters with as much accuracy as we can possibly get. If you've taken other courses from me or watched other videos from me, you will know that I'm a huge fan of simulating data to evaluate and develop data analysis methods. I love simulating data because it gives us full control over all the characteristics of the data, including the amount of noise in the data, and it means that we have access to the ground truth. So we can actually quantitatively evaluate the performance of the model because we actually know the underlying generative parameters, which is generally unknown in real data, in empirical data. Okay, so what are we going to do? We are going to create some two-dimensional Gaussians. These are 2D Gaussian blurs. This is the formula for creating a two-dimensional Gaussian. So we have 
e to the, and then all of this business, minus x squared plus y squared divided by 2 times sigma squared. So these x and y terms here are matrices. They are grids of numbers. So these, this is a grid of x-axis values and a grid of y-axis values. These are the two parameters that govern the center of the Gaussian. So we subtract the center point x from the x-grid locations and the center point y from the y-axis locations. So setting these to be both zero means that the Gaussian is going to be centered at the origin of the graph. And if we change these values, then we can actually move the Gaussian around in space. So these are the 2D grids of the coordinates, and these are the center locations. And then the other key parameter of a Gaussian is this sigma character here, which is used as a like the spread or the width of the Gaussian. So let me show you what these look like in an image. So here we see an image that is a two-dimensional Gaussian blur. So it's just kind of this fuzzy star in the middle of, uh, of the sky over here. It's like the sun. So these two parameters here, Cx and Cy, correspond to the center of the Gaussian, which in this case would be somewhere around here. And the sigma parameter determines the spread, so how blurry this Gaussian is. So the wider this Gaussian, the larger this Gaussian, the higher this value. And if this Gaussian were really tightly packed, if this were a really, really small Gaussian, then that would mean that this sigma parameter is very small. Okay, and this means that for every image, we can come up with three parameters. So the two center locations and the sigma parameter. Here you see some examples of different Gaussians. This is similar to what you saw on the previous slide, except I have added a little bit of noise. You can see that these are noisy Gaussians. Now what we are going to do is develop a model, a convolutional neural network that can input the data, which is the image, these pictures, and return the three key parameters, the x and y location, and the sigma, the width of the Gaussian. So that is pretty neat. By the way, these dashed white lines here are just a grid for reference that I added at the end to the image. These are actually, these are not actually part of the image itself. These are not part of the data. Okay, so this is our goal. We are going to train a CNN model to learn these three parameters, X and Y, so these are the center coordinates, and R here for the, the radius here. And then we will test on unseen Gaussians where no parameters are actually known to the model in advance. And what you see drawn on top of these images is the center location and the sigma parameter or the radius that was determined by the model. So these are not the locations and widths that I specified a priori. These are the parameters that the model learned to estimate. And you can see that it looks really great, right? Even in the case where the Gaussians are not entirely within the image, so even when the, the Gaussians are cut off, the model still does a really good job of identifying the center and the width of the distributions based on what we train the model to, to learn. Okay, so that's the goal. Now let me show you what our deep learning model will look like. I call this model GaussNet because it is uh, built just to uh, solve this problem. So we start with our image. It's going to be a 91 by 91 pixel image. So 91 uh, pixels on each dimension. It's a square image. The one here is because this is a grayscale image. It's pseudo colored here, but we don't have uh, RGB channels. This is just a one dimensional, one color dimensional image. Now, if you have studied deep learning before, if you are familiar with convolutional neural networks, then you will probably recognize the general organization of this network. We have a convolutional layer with six feature maps that get extracted, so six kernels that are learned from the data. And then we have an average pooling to go down to an image dimension of 45 by 45, so cutting the image size in half. And then we have another convolution pooling block where ultimately we get down to four feature maps or four convolution kernels that are learned and the image size will be 22 by 22. And then that feeds into a fully connected 
layer of 50 units and finally to an output layer of three units. Now this final output layer here needs to have three units because we have three parameters that we are predicting. The X and Y center locations and the radius or the sigma parameter. Now if you are not familiar with deep learning then it's okay. The main point is that we start with an image. We start with a picture of size 91 by 91 and we are training this model to learn specific sets of features which are particular correlational patterns across the different pixels in the image and ultimately that will give us an output of three numbers. So the model takes an image as an input and it outputs three numbers which we hope will map onto the center locations and the width of the Gaussian blur. Now this kind of architecture reflects a common feature of CNNs. We have two main parts to the CNN. We have the image processing part and here the goal is to extract important features out of the image. So this transforms the image from a set of pixels into feature representations. And then we have the fully connected part at the end of the CNN model. And the goal here is to make predictions about the features. This is a standard architecture for an artificial neural network or a fully connected neural network. Okay, so with all of this as an introduction, let's now switch to Python and implement this from scratch in PyTorch. So here we are at Google Colab. When you first come to Google Colab, you might get a screen that looks something like this with some examples, recent Google Drive. You can click on GitHub and search for my GitHub name, which is Mike X Cohen. Search that, and then there's multiple repositories. You want to find the repository that is called Deep Learning Demos, and then you want to select this one. It's called Deep Learning Demo CNN Gauss Params for Gaussian parameters. So we click that, that's going to open up that notebook file. Now keep in mind that this is a copy of the notebook file from my GitHub page. You can change the text as much as you want. That's probably not a good idea. Let me undo this. You can change the text as much as you want, which is fine, but those changes, any changes you make are not going to be saved. If you want to save this file to play around with it on your own, you can click on copy to drive. You can uh, click on file and yeah, save a copy in your drive. You can download a copy, a notebook version or the raw Python version. So what I'm going to do now is walk through the code. Now, as I mentioned in the beginning of this video, there's a lot of details about Python coding and about PyTorch that I am not going to explain in detail. But I do go over all of these details in my course. So if you are interested in learning everything that this code is doing and why it's doing all this stuff, then I invite you to consider checking out the full length version of this course. Okay, so this says, uh, warning this notebook was not authored by Google. It's totally fine. This is just a warning telling you that the file is loaded from my GitHub page. We can run anyway. Okay, so now we are going to import a bunch of libraries that we'll, we'll need, mainly PyTorch and NumPy and Matplotlib for the visualization. Here, we are going to create the two-dimensional Gaussian blurs. You can see that I'm going to create 1,000 of these images. So we're gonna use 1,000 pictures for training the model. And here is the image size. So it's gonna be 91 by 91. Now, if you like on your own after this video, I encourage you to play around with these parameters. You can see, for example, if we still get good accurate performance, if you use, you know, let's say 100 images instead of 1,000 images, or maybe smaller images or larger images and so on. Okay, so I'm not gonna go through all of this code in detail, but you can see the main formula that I showed in the slides a few moments ago. So e to the minus x squared plus y squared divided by this width parameter, which is just set to be some random number. Okay, so that creates all of our pictures. Here we are going to visualize some of these images and that you see over here as soon as I finish the drawing, yeah. So here you see some of the images of the Gaussians that we will present to the model along with the generating parameters listed on top. 
Okay, so now I'm going to split the data into train and test groups. This is an important aspect of training a deep learning model because we need to make sure that the model is really learning fundamental parameters and not just memorizing a bunch of specific instances. And so to do that, to make sure that the model performance will generalize to new data, we split the data into a training group and a test group. So that's what gets done here using a combination of scikit-learn and PyTorch utilities. Okay, and then here, well, it's always a good idea to do some sanity checking and check the sizes of different parts of your data set. So we generated 1000 images and they are of size 91 by 91. And here we see that the size of the training data set is 900 by 1 by 91 by 91. This actually makes sense because I have specified here that I want to use 90% of the data for training and 10% of the data for testing. Here, this is the, the size of the output of the model, which is also the target variable. This is 900 by three, because we have 900 images in the training set and three parameters that the model needs to learn. Okay, and here is where we create the deep learning model. I'm doing this using a Python function that will return a class object, an instance of a class for this particular model. Now there are several ways to define and set up your deep learning models. This is one specific way that has some advantages and some limitations. In the full version of the course, I go through multiple ways of defining these different models. But what you can see is I've organized the code into three little like code paragraphs here corresponding to the three major sections of the neural network. So this is the conf pool block one, which is the first conf pool block. Here is the second conf pool block. And here is the final linear layer that actually makes the decisions about the model parameters based on the features of the images that were learned by these two conf pool blocks. So this is basically just the PyTorch implementation of the visualization of the model that I showed you in these slides. We use MSC loss function and the Atom optimizer, which is a very efficient and powerful optimizer using a learning rate of 0 0.001. Okay, so let's run this code. And now one thing that I like to do, which I strongly encourage people to do as they are learning about models and developing their own models is to test the model with one batch of data. So what I do here is create a fresh instance of the model, and then I push some data through the model and then basically just check that the model actually works. Now, this is an untrained model. I do not expect this model to have any reasonably accurate performance. This model will actually perform terribly. It's purely random, but if you have experience developing deep learning models or as you gain experience de developing deep learning models, you will find that it's very easy to make some little tiny mistakes in some of these parameter settings here and those little mistakes are going to cause your model to crash. And that is what we are looking for here. So before we even get to training, we need to make sure that the model architecture is totally accurate. So here is the model output for 16 pictures. So I inputted 16 pictures of those 2D Gaussians, and this is the model output. Now, again, I do not expect to be able to interpret these, this would correspond to the X axis location of the center, the Y location of the center of the Gaussian and the width. Now this doesn't even make sense. You can't have a negative width, but uh, again, totally random model weights. We just want to make sure that we're not seeing any error messages in here, which is great, we don't. This is uh, something to show us a summary of all the parameters in the model. This is also always very interesting to see. You can see that the convolutional parts of the model actually have very, very few parameters, only 600, uh, sorry, 280 parameters in total to learn for the convolutional parts of the model. In contrast, those orange bits at the end of the model, the linear layers, the fully connected or feed forward layers, those have tons of 
parameters to learn, almost 10,000 parameters. So it's really, this is really a top heavy model. The convolutional part is very light on parameters and the feed forward part that actually does the char uh, categorization is very dense on parameters. Okay, so that is a summary of the model. Here I have a function, so this is a PyTorch function that will train the model. We're going to train for 30 epochs. And again, there's a lot of code in here that I don't expect you to understand if you are brand new to deep learning or the PyTorch library. But essentially the idea is that we loop through a bunch of training epochs, that is this loop here, we push our data through the network and we get an output. So this is the model's prediction of the three parameters. We compute the loss function. So this is the difference between what the model predicted and the actual target value, which we know because we generated these data. Now the model needs to learn from these errors and that's done through a procedure called backpropagation, which is often termed backprop. And that's what these three lines of code do here. They just ignite the backprop algorithm. Now, as I've mentioned before, we need to partition the data into a training set and a test set so that we can make sure that the model is really learning some underlying features of the data and not simply memorizing a bunch of specific instances. So therefore, we also test the model performance on the test data set, which is actually never shown. These are images that are never shown to the model during training. Now, putting the entire model training procedure into a Python function like this is pretty convenient because once we set up this code here, all we need to do to run the model is call that function. So this function now will create a fresh instance of the model, it will train the model, and it will output the loss for the uh, training data, the loss for the test data, and the fully trained version of that model. Now, this is the version of the model that has all of the correct parameters that will accurately estimate the generative parameters underlying these two-dimensional Gaussian blurs. Okay, so now the training is finished. We can see over here that it took around 50 seconds, so a bit under a minute, to do all of the training. Now we're going to make a plot of the loss function. So you see there's a blue line and an orange line. The x-axis corresponds to the training epoch. So you can think of this as time during training. The y-axis here corresponds to the loss function. So smaller numbers closer to zero are better. That means the model is more accurate. And then finally, the two lines correspond to the training data and the test data. And what you want to look for when you investigate these loss functions is that the loss goes down and it should basically asymptote toward some value. It doesn't necessarily need to be zero. It's often not going to be zero, but you want to see that the model is basically at an asymptote indicating that it's done learning. Okay, so now let's visualize some of these results. Let's see what the model has actually learned. What I'm doing here is plotting an image of the Gaussian. That is the same code as in the very beginning of this script, and then I'm computing the model's prediction for these three key variables, the center locations and the radius, or the full width at half maximum, that's the sigma parameter that I showed in the slides. And yeah, a little bit of trigonometry just to make sure that we are plotting the radius or converting this radius into a circle. Okay, so here we see the results. So most of these look really, really great. The model is spot on. It got the center location and also the radius to be very accurate. Now here is a really interesting case where the model failed utterly. The model really didn't do very well here. But not surprising, the Gaussian is barely in this image. This is crazy. I mean, the center of the Gaussian here is probably, you know, it's like way off the picture here. So. On the one hand, the model did not do very well, but on the other hand, I'm not very surprised in this case. In all of these other cases, I think the model did quite well, even in this case where, where a lot of the Gaussian is cut off from the image. Okay, the last thing that I would like to do here is look at the relationship between the original model generating parameters, so the ground truth, which we know because we simulated these data, and the predictions of the model. So that you can see in this image here. So on the x-axis, we have the true values, 
And on the y-axis, we have the predicted values. These are the outputs from the model. Now, if the model were perfect, if the model could exactly reproduce every single detail of the generating parameters, we would expect all of these dots to lie on a perfect line, exactly on a line, and the correlations would be exactly one. So they're not exactly one here, and you can see some variability, and that indicates that the model didn't do perfectly, but it did quite well overall. The correlations are 0.98 and 0.95, for the radius. I hope you enjoyed this video and this demonstration of using a deep convolutional neural network to learn underlying generative parameters for Gaussian distributions.